and I don't mean this to sound cynical, but no one is really interested in what is inside you as a human and what your natural strengths are. Because the mm. whole approach to education and work is basically that each one of us is an empty vessel and we can fill it with whatever education we wanted to fill it with. You're watching Young and Profiting Podcast on YouTube. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Hala Taha, and on Young and Profiting Podcast, we investigate a new topic each week and interview some of the brightest minds in the world. Before we get started, hit the subscribe button and don't forget to click the bell icon to be notified every time we drop a new video. Hey, Marcus, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Hi, Hala. How are you? Good. I'm really excited to chat with you today. You are an expert on all things careers, thriving in the workplace, improving your productivity and things like that. You're a best-selling author. You're a motivational speaker. You're also a researcher, which is very interesting. So I can't wait to dig into all of that. Um, So to set some context for our listeners, I want to understand the difference between strengths and weaknesses, because this is something that you talk very often about, and I want to ask some follow-up questions about that. So uh, with that said, could you just lay some some foundation uh, for our listeners about strengths versus weaknesses? Yeah, sure. I um, I actually joined the Gallup organization when I first came to the U.S. about 25 years ago, and Gallup's known for polling, but I did the side that wasn't polling. It was focused on how do you measure things about a human that are really important but that you can't count, things like strengths, things like weaknesses. And when you start to research strengths, um, obviously at the time I was building something called Strength Finder with, um, with my mentor who was the chairman of Gallup, Don Clifton. And when you really dive into strengths, what you discover, and weaknesses, you discover that a strength isn't what you're good at and a weakness isn't what you're bad at. Because we've all got some things that we're really, really, really good at that we hate. So what would you call that? What would you call something where you are really effective at it, but doing it drains you or bores you or drags you down? A burnout, burnout right. scale or something like that. And it's funny, that happens in school, doesn't it? Where you can get, you can continually get A's in a class, but you're not there. I mean, emotionally, you're not there. Psychologically, you're not there. You sort of procrastinate that class. Somehow you end up with an A because you're smart or you're diligent or something. But when you really push in it, what you find is that um, all of us respond to situations in life, activities, people, contexts, in a, in a way that's either positively or emotionally, um, it's either a little jolt up or a little pull down. Ne- nothing is really emotionally zero. And so weaknesses are any activity that weakens you, even if you're good at it. Mm. A strength is any activity that strengthens you, even if you're not good at it yet. So a strength is far more appetite than it is pure ability. And so what that pushes you towards, you realize that the person who knows what your strengths and weaknesses are better than anyone else in the world is you. Yeah. So then how do you start to understand like what's a strength for you and what's a weakness? Like how do you measure that and evaluate that? Well, probably the simplest thing, and we've done this with 10, 11, 12 year olds, by the way, for your listeners, just know, unfortunately, no one at school or in college or at work, no one is interested in finding out your now, I know it sounds weird to say, but no one, and I don't mean this to sound cynical, but no one is really interested in what is inside you as a human and what your natural strengths are. Because the Mm. whole approach to education and work is basically that each one of us is an empty vessel and we can fill it with whatever education we wanted to fill it with, test you occasionally to see how full your vessel is through exams or tests. And the best student or the best worker is he or she who's the fullest. So the idea that each one of us is beautifully unique with unique strengths and weaknesses is sort of lost on school or on work. But for you, if you wanted to figure out what your particular natural strengths are and weaknesses, the simplest thing to do is to use a regular week of your life. Just take a blank, maybe it's a blank pad, maybe it's a a page on your your phone or whatever, draw a line down the middle of the pad and put, I loved it at the top of one column and loathed it at the top of the other column. And then Mm. take it around with you for a week. Anytime you find yourself looking forward to a a particular activity before you're doing it, scribble it down in the moment, in the loved it column. Anytime you find yourself with time just flying by and what felt like five minutes, you look up and it's an hour, scribble it down. Anytime when you're done with it, it felt like it just clicked. It just clicked. It was almost like you knew how to do it without having to learn how to do it. So rapid learning, scribble it down in the loved it column. Anytime you see the inverse color, Before you're doing it, you're pushing it off to the side of your desk or something. You're trying to shove it under the filing cabinet. When you're doing it, time sort of drags on it. You you get to the end, but you're Mm. an empty husk. 
Anytime anything like that, scribble it down in the low thick column. Just spend a week using the raw material of your life to show you where is the positive valence at the level of the activity and where is the negative. And you'll get to the end of the week and you'll have a list. You'll have a list not of like theoretical terms like strategic thinking or executive presence or growth orientation or entrepreneurship. Yeah. Not that. You'll have a list of actual activities, some of which super draw you in and some of which bore you or drain you, as you said, burn you out. That is a beautiful starting point to begin to identify for yourself where you get strength from life. And because strength and appetite and appetite and practice and performance and practice are this beautiful ongoing loop, the more detailed you can be about which particular activities draw you back, those are your strengths. You may not be good at them yet. You may not be. You may just be drawn to them repeatedly. But the beautiful thing is you've used your life, not someone's theoretical models, but your life of, to help you know what are the particular aspects, activities, situations, contexts, moments that strengthen you. Those are your strengths and you can do it at 11 years old. Yeah, I love that. I love tactical advice. So I think everybody who's listening should take heed and do that activity to find out their strengths and weaknesses. Now, I know that you're, you have a very strong belief that you should not uh, really focus on your weaknesses. A lot of people have it backwards. They, they focus a lot on improving their weaknesses, but you say focus on your strengths. Why is that? And how can we start to build up our strengths even better? And you know, how did you come up with the fact that you feel that weaknesses really aren't where you should focus? Well, to begin with, just to sort of clarify, um, I don't feel it. I don't think it. I'm a, I'm a researcher, so I sort of go mm -hmm. into any situation with a blank canvas. We went in, this was about 25 years ago now, but we went and basically studied highly performing managers or team leaders and lower performing team, and team, team, team leaders. And, and companies would give us their top 100 managers and uh, their bottom 100 managers. And we'd do this again and again and again and again. So you're constantly looking in the world of research, it's called a study group and a contrast group. So you just keep talking to the world's best managers and team leaders and you ask them a whole bunch of questions about what do you do? What do you do to get the best out of your people? And although every single one of the members, and by the way, it got to be about 80,000. So 80,000 interviews like the one that you're doing with me now, but we transcribe everything that was said and, and then and pour over the transcripts looking for, well, looking for similarities basically. And of course what mm -hmm. you find, the first thing you find is that all of these really great team leaders are really different from one another. And I don't mean just difference in terms of sort of race or age or nationality or whatever, but just difference in terms of their style. Some of the best team leaders are, um, very future focused. Some of them are very now focused. Some of them are very conceptual. Mm. Some of them are very tactical. So they're all different in terms of their style. But one of the things that they all shared was a deep realization that each person on their team, A, was, in, was enduringly unique. Even if you have 10 salespeople, you don't have 10 salespeople. You have 10 individuals who happen to be in selling. And each one of those people sells in a slightly different way. And what you as a leader have to do is not try to make them all the same. You as a leader have to figure out, a bit like playing chess versus checkers, right? Chess, all the pieces move differently. The best team leaders realize that each of these pieces move differently. First of all, you've got to figure out as a, as a chess playing team leader, um, who's the knight, who's the rook, who's the queen, who's the bishop, who's the, like you, you try to figure out the uniqueness of each person. And then they said, if you've got a rook, don't try and turn it into a bishop. It's like if you've got somebody who naturally sells by building relationships with people and getting them to trust you, what you do is you help them to maximize that intelligently. And if you've got someone who really sells simply because of the force of their personality, they close quickly. They're just a closer. That's what they do. That's what I love to do. You, you help them to cultivate that intelligently. You don't try and turn them into someone who you go, well, jolly well done for being a good closer. But now we need to work on fixing your you know, relationship building. They don't do mm. that. And they don't do it not because they're trying to be nice. I mean, maybe some of them are, but they're doing it because they realize you've always got as a, as a team leader. Now for you as a CEO, you'll know this more and more and more over time. You're always thinking about return on investment. You're mm -hmm. always thinking about where's the ROI. And I don't mean of a business. I mean of a human. Where will yeah. you get the most growth? And the best team leaders seem to understand what neuroscientists have only just begun to measure. Namely, that you will get the most growth, the most development, the most performance improvement by figuring out where somebody already has some kind of comparative advantage. 
and then you maximize it. Now we can talk about how to maximize it in a, in a, in a minute, but it's like, that is a mind blowingly important thing for you to understand in your career because everywhere you go in school, obviously if you get, in fact, we ask this question every year for the last 25 years, your child comes home. So we asked it of parents. Your child comes mm -hmm. home with the following grades, English A, Social Studies A, Biology C, Algebra F. Which mm -hmm. grade deserves the most attention from you? And there isn't a single year, Hala, where less than 70% of American parents focus on the F. If you give them the choice of those grades, every parent, by the way, every teacher, goes straight to the F because we're frightened of the F. And then you get mm -hmm. to work. When you start your career, you'll find that we turn the word F into something called an area of opportunity or an area for development. So in the world of work, we have strengths, jolly well done for having those, and then areas of development. The best managers mm -hmm. in the world go, wait a minute, that is completely bass backwards. You have strengths, which are your areas for development, and then you have weaknesses that we need to manage around. Every mm -hmm. single effective sports coach if you look at them, like look at Tom Brady. Tom Brady has very specific strengths as a player and a whole shed load of weaknesses. If you want to get the best out of Tom Brady, you do not say to Tom, okay, let's just ignore your strengths for a while. Let's really focus on turning your weaknesses. And he has so many. I mean, mobility being the most obvious one of them. And let's try and turn you into Patrick Mahomes. I mean, we, when we say it like that, we know that sounds stupid. And yet the really sad mm. thing is that for most of you who are listening in your careers, that is exactly the advice you're going to get. Yeah. Find out where your lack of mobility is. We'll call that an area for development and we'll put together an individual development plan for you so that you can emerge this well-rounded, perfect human. Well, I'm sorry, the most successful people in the world, the most successful team leaders in the world realize that each one of us is enduringly unique and over the course of our life, we don't turn into someone else. We get more and more and more and more of who we already are. And the real challenge for us is, can you get to become an incredibly intelligent version of who you are? Best team leaders figured that out so fast. I'm not gonna turn my knight into a rook. I gotta figure out how to maximize these really beautifully unique people. Yeah. That's so interesting. And I know that, you know, I had a guest, her name is Dory Clark, you might be familiar with her. She was on my episode number one, a long time ago, she's a, a career expert, a reinvention coach. And she said that sometimes your weaknesses can be your biggest strengths. So do you have an opinion about that? Have you seen that where your weaknesses are actually, you know, somewhat related to your biggest strengths as well? Well, that's an interesting question, because normally the way that it's positioned is the other way around. You'll hear an awful lot of people say, yeah, but that strength, better watch out for it. That strength of yours can also become a weakness. So you'll yeah, have somebody, exactly. Right? You'll, you'll, you'll hear it twisted around. So some people say, well, look, you're naturally very good at confrontation. Your mind doesn't go blank. Somehow the words come really smoothly. And uh, you are just, whenever there's a confrontation moment, you're, you're really good in the middle of it. But watch out. Don't use it too much. Because then it'll turn into people who think you're rude or aggressive. So you need yep. to turn that down a little bit. Or they'll say the same with empathy. You know, well, you're really empathetic, but you know what? You're, you're, you're too soft. You're too soft. You can't always yeah. be empathetic, you know? In fact, most people's coaches, I'm not saying this was true of hers, but because she actually framed it really interestingly the other way around. Most of what you'll hear, most of what your listeners will hear is, is the other way around, where people will spend really well-intended people like your mother will tell you, because they want to help you, tone that down a little bit. Your best boss that you first meet, when you first meet a boss that you really like, they'll, they'll spend a lot of time going, well, th th this is great, but you need, to, ah, you need to turn it down a little bit. The first thing that all of us should remember is no good advice, basically when you peel it back, sounds like be less of who you are. That is never good coaching advice or career, be less of who you are. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody can't help you go, wait a minute, Marcus, Sometimes when you're confronting people, which you're great at, sometimes you seem to actually be pushing them further away from where you want them to get to. How can you be more? Now, now I mean, what's great, Marcus, with you is your words come really quickly when you're angry. I don't know. Some people, they shut down. You don't. You get angrier and you just get cold and crisp and you're, wow, crazy town. That's so good. How can you use it in a way that actually gets the outcome you want? You know, sometimes with kids, I'm sure you've seen this with with either kids that you have or relatives that you've got or whatever, kids, it's almost like their strengths are too big for their little bodies. 
So mm -hmm. when they have natural strength, sometimes it's like they haven't grown into them yet. In fact, what a career yeah. is really is kind of growing into your natural strengths so that you can use them really intelligently. Your strength, you, you can never have too much of a strength. If anyone ever tells you you've got too much of that strength, block that comment out because what they're yeah. really saying, they might be saying is, you're not using that strength quite effectively enough. Okay, that's a, legi that, that's a legitimate piece of coaching advice and that might make you pause and think, huh, I wonder how I can tweak or fine tune or adjust that so I can use my natural uh, proclivities to actually get done what I want to get done. The other way around is kind of an interesting framing that your weaknesses are also part of your strengths. I, I, I would say this, um, what weakens you can't also strengthen you. So if you define a strength and a weakness the way I did up front, which frankly most people don't, they, they normally say a strength is what you're good at and a weakness is what you're bad at. But if a strength is what strengthens you and a weakness is what weakens you, then what weakens you can't also strengthen you. It's, almost, it's a logical non, non, non sequitur, right? Mm -hmm. But some of the things that strengthen you in some situations can prove effective for you and in other situations they won't prove effective for you. For example, you might be somebody who is strengthened by persuading someone to do something they didn't intend to do. You love selling and you love the clothes. And then because you love selling and because no one really helped you understand which bit of it you really loved. Mm -hmm. And when you were selling for that, um, for that uh, medical device company, you got closes all the time. It was so great because you got the little signature on the thing and you were like, yeah. And then you got promoted, I don't know why, but you got promoted to work for a pharmaceutical company like Amgen or something, or Genentech. And you went in and you, you know, you're quote unquote good at selling, but you go in there and you suddenly realize that in pharmaceutical sales, you never close. There's no close. There's no signature. You're just influencing doctors to write prescriptions. And so you go in there thinking, I'm, I'm, re I'm really strong at selling. But actually, mm -hmm. you're not. What strengthened you was the close, and you went and joined a pharmaceutical sales company where there's no close. So in that sense, your weakness and your strength is stayed the same. What strengthened you stayed the same. What weakened you stayed the same. It's just that in one context, it was super useful to help you be effective in the job. And in the pharmaceutical sales, that, that very same thing, that very same part of you actually proved to be diminishing for you, super frustrating for you. And if any of your listeners have ever found that in their career, where you go, wait a minute, I, I, what happened to me? Because I was doing, I was killing it over here. And I moved over here and suddenly I'm like, I may actually still be able to quote unquote do the job, but I'm like every day I wake up and I'm in a really bad mood. What, like, why? So often it's because yeah. there's some part of your previous job that was, that was strengthening to you, some activity or situation or person or context, in that case, the clothes was strengthening to you and you moved into a job where there's none of it. And obviously that would have been so helpful for one to learn at 11 or 12 or 13. But unfortunately for most of us, we have to sort of figure this out as we go along during the course of our career. Yeah. Wow, I loved everything that you just said. You're, you're giving so many value bombs away. The two big takeaways that I have is, again, going back to writing down what you love and what you loathe and really taking the time to think about that and to figure that out so that when you are in situations where you feel burnt out, you know exactly why and so that you can make the right career decisions and kind of evaluate your, you know, your future experiences based on what you're actually good at. And so that you don't, you know, make a big career change and then you end up hating your job. That's when you were doing really great. So yeah. I definitely agree there. I also love uh, your feedback about, uh, sorry, your feedback about feedback that you shouldn't just listen to everyone, even if they have good intentions, like your mom or a boss that, that might really want you to succeed, but they just don't know how to give proper advice and they give you bad advice so that's super important yeah and on that point by the way Harla, if you look at many of your listeners are going to bump into this so much of this where somebody will say you need to you need to know how to take feedback or hey come and sit out i want to give you some i want to give you some feedback and of course in today's high-tech world there are so many tools um and functions functions and features that allow you to get feedback all the time from mm -hmm. people and if you're in the corporate world you work for Disney, you'll know this, you actually have yeah. formal ways of getting feedback. Sometimes it's called a performance review or, 
or a, a performance appraisal or and it used to happen once a year now it seems to happen with little apps and stuff now it's you're getting feedback all the time um what i would strongly suggest to your listeners is block all of it out all of it feedback never ever helps you excel ever wow what we and and the reason the reason why that is well there's one small exception sorry there's one small exception when 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 success in a job requires you to know a certain fact or a certain prescribed sequence of steps and you're getting the steps wrong let's say you're a nurse and you, there's a step sequence to give a safe and painless injection and you miss one of the steps it is entirely appropriate for someone to come in and go hey you missed a step or if you got yeah. a fact wrong like you know the american independence war was this date and you say that date then somebody can say you got that date wrong so when it comes to predetermined facts or steps then feedback is fine because someone might tell you that you've missed one but excellence in any job you're a ceo right now right you got 40 people you're charging around like a mad prune and no part of your job <laughs> is a prescribed sequence of steps i mean yes yeah. you need to know how to turn this particular technology on that you and i you know you need to know how to do that you need to know how to save the file and then cut it up into bits and like you need to know all how to do that and if someone can teach you how to do that great but other than that everything that you're doing everything that you're learning every moment that you're kind of doing your very best work is a function of inside out it's you taking your natural patterns of loves and lows your natural synaptic connection patterns and turning them into behavior stimuli of life is hitting you all the time and you're just choosing um making a choice here doing this not that thousands of these every day when somebody tries to give you advice when somebody tries to give you feedback when you really look at what they're saying even with the very best of intentions what they're really saying to you is you would do this job better hala if you did it more like me because all i've got is my own experience i'm telling you hey you need to do a bit more of that you need to do a little less of that you should do this you should do that and it it's basically someone taking their own experience and even with the best of intentions smothering you with them yeah. and so instead you shouldn't ask for feedback and if you are a manager of other people or a colleague but never give feedback instead what you can do and what's so legit to do is say what your reaction is just be way more humble don't cross the feedback bridge and start giving advice left right and just stay on your side of the bridge and say look my reaction was this so hala if you said to me hey marcus um you know i just really didn't understand what you just said that's your reaction that is so legit i can't say yes you did hala you totally did i can't say that you could your reaction is your reaction you're the owner of your reaction you can say i didn't understand what you just said or you could say i was really bored by what you just said i can't then go no you weren't bored you were bored so that's yeah. your reaction tell me your reaction if you go through your career and you're blind or deaf to other people's reactions to you okay that's a miss you need to listen for their reactions just smile and close your ears when they start giving you feedback on what you should do differently the only way that actually they can help you know what to do differently or better is not only if they react when something didn't go well but actually the best thing to listen for is for their their reaction when something really 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 worked well that you did your and this again it's one of those mind blowingly obvious things when you say it but no one teaches you this your the the raw material for your future greatness is your current goodness your raw material for your future greatness is not your current failure it's your current areas where you're already doing something where people went oh, that was cool that presentation you gave you know what you know not everything about it was great frankly but this part i lent in like crazy if you built a whole presentation where you did more of that 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 moment there i don't know i just lent in i couldn't stop myself from leaning in it was so you nailed it your energy was fantastic that room if someone's telling you their reaction about what worked that's yeah. not them being nice to you that is them giving you raw material to help you know what should i tack towards what should i do more of what should i fine tune or refine because frankly most of us we charge through life and we're trying our best we do a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of this 
other people's reaction to what worked, whether it's an email you wrote, whether it's a campaign you started, whether it's a relationship you built, whether it's a presentation you gave, if someone is reacting to what bits of it worked, oh my word, that is the best, best coaching advice you can ever get from someone. So different, by the way, than when someone's telling you what you should do differently, which as I said, normally turns out to be, you would do better if only you did it more like me. Yeah. So when you hear feedback, just your, your alarm bells should go off. Yeah. Oh my gosh. This is excellent. I love that when you said smile and close your ears when you hear feedback. That's such a good tip for people. And, you know, a lot of people think that they're supposed to get feedback and they don't realize that most feedback is actually negative. Like when somebody asks you for feedback, you're thinking, well, what's what's the one negative thing I can think about this person and, and give them some constructive criticism? You're not thinking about good feedback, right? And I know that you, you actually have this opinion about 360 reviews. You, you call them gossip. So tell us about your opinion on 360 reviews because we did that. At, I don't work at Disney anymore, but we did that at Disney. And I have a great story about how, you know, somebody who was just kind of out to gave, get me gave really bad feedback, which had not like, you know, if you ask any of my past managers of the past 10 years or any of my past coworkers, everybody would be like, that doesn't sound anything like Hala, you know, yeah. but it's just one person who was out to get me. So talk to us about 360 feedback. Well, again, as with everything else, I don't have an opinion about anything. You go in and Sorry you about that. Tell us about the facts. <laughs> right. I mean, it, and I only say that because, as you know, in this day and age, sort of everyone's a thought leader. I think this. I think that. I think this. I was a chef, but now I'm a life coach. It's like, how does all... Everyone's a thought leader. So it's important if you have data to sort of start with, well, the data show, because then you, you're not really just putting your opinion out. You're going, this is what we can see in the world. When it comes to 360s, first of all, you're right. In, in many, many cases, they're an opportunity for someone anonymously to lob little hand grenades at other people. So there's that whole part of it, which is just dangerous and politically damaging and psychologically hurtful. Um, but even if you de-anonymize it, the basic, the, the, there's two basic huge flaws with any 360. For any of you listening that are forced to go through a 360, just keep your mind in focused on these two flaws. Again, you may have to smile and just kind of pretend, but know that these two flaws are right there at the heart of all 360s. The first is that you can learn about success from studying failure. That if somebody's using a 360 to point out where your gaps are, you can learn a lot from studying your gaps. Remember, you learn nothing about success from studying failure. Let me let, let's just all be really clear. There's so much stuff. Ah, failure is such a great teacher. No, it isn't. Failure teaches you about failure. If you wanted to learn about failure, study it up the wazoo. It teaches you nothing about success. In fact, some aspects of failure are really similar to success. So if you study failure and then say, don't do that, you won't succeed. It's like saying, if you studied really unhappy marriages, you actually, and this is true, you find out that people argue a lot. You count the arguments, there are a lot of arguments. So what you would then say is, well, to have a happy marriage, you shouldn't argue. But you actually study really happy marriages, you count the number of arguments, there are exactly the same number of arguments. Or rather, there's no statistically significant difference between the number of arguments in a happy marriage and the number of arguments in a rotten one. It turns out that the difference between a happy marriage and a, and a rotten one isn't the number of arguments, it's what goes on in the space between the arguments. And in the unhappy marriages, somehow you lean away from one another and each argument is proof of the need to kind of be armored against the other person's attacks. And somehow in a happy marriage, the arguments are a sign for more reaching toward one another, more intimacy, more curiosity. So if you just studied really unhappy marriages, found out that they argued a lot, you'd go, well, well then if you want a good one, don't argue, which is completely wrong. It's like saying health is the absence of disease. In order to learn about health, we should study disease. No, if you want to learn about disease, you study disease, which is fine, do that, but don't imagine that's health. Health is a totally yeah. different thing. So that's the first thing with 360s. They're predicated on the idea that to get better, you should figure out where you're kind of failing, according to your 360 colleagues, and then fix it. Okay, completely wrong. You will um, learn more about how you're going to excel from those places where you excel. But very quickly, the second thing that's problematic, hugely problematic with 360s, is they're based on the idea that I am a reliable rater of you on anything. And it turns out, after 50 years of research on this, it turns out that the only thing I'm a reliable rater of 
is my own feelings and experiences. I'm a pretty good relator, or rater rather, of whether I'm bored by a presentation. I'm a good rater of a restaurant that I just went to. Uh, will I go there again? I can rate that. I can rate whether I will advocate that restaurant to friends and family. I can do all of that because it's all about me rating me. Turns out I'm a terrible rater of your strategic thinking or your empathy or anything in you. I'm a terrible rater of it. And it turns out there's a thing called, and this is going to sound long and kind of convoluted, but it's called the idiosyncratic rater effect. And it basically means when I rate you, my rating of you is idiosyncratic and it reflects me more than it does you. And we know that because when I rate 10 people on something like empathy, presumably if I was really seeing them through a window, if you like, the ratings would change because I'm looking at 10 different people. But we know measurably the ratings don't change. My ratings move with me. I am in a sense revealing myself as I'm rating these 10 people. 360s are supposed to be a window into other people. They're not, they're a mirror. They're just me bouncing me back at me. And for those of you who are listening, who are stat heads, you'll know that if your measurement system has systematic error in it, which this is, systematic error, the more data you add doesn't get rid of the error. It adds to the error. It's like if you've got one broken thermometer, you've got one bad measurement. If you have 15 broken thermometers, you've now got 15 bad measurements and you're no closer to knowing how hot it is outside. So that's what a 360 is. It's a systematically error-filled, um, badly designed focus on failure. And it's like, and unfortunately for many of your listeners, you're going to bump into this. Some well-intended team leader is going to go, hey, here's this new nifty 360. It's part of our human capital management system and it's going to help you get better. Okay. Yeah. Whenever you see that, like, again, you may have to smile to be politically savvy. But just please don't let your career be determined by other people's faulty thermometers. Yeah. It's so crazy because I know that so many corporations do this and so many of us are going through these feedback reviews and there's so many like messed up outcomes as a result of this. There's so many managers who are focusing on the wrong things and team members who are just drowning because they're worried about their weaknesses, not focusing on their strengths. It sounds so, so broken, you know, and that's just really sad to me that it's, it's so broken right now. No, it is. And the, the, well, it, it is broken and it will stay broken until we realize and take seriously the idea that each one of us isn't permanently malleable. That, that you are Hala and you are... The least interesting thing about you is that you're Palestinian, you're a woman. Why? Be because there are hundreds of thousands of others. There's only one you. And the full extent of how unique you are is if, if we actually count the number of synaptic connections in your brain, we find out two things. One, you have as many, you, Hala, have as many synaptic connections in your brain as there are stars in 5,000 Milky Ways. And that isn't a silly exaggeration. That is wow. the full, massive, overwhelming, beautiful, filigreed truth of the fact that you will shine the way that you shine only one, there'll be only one person ever in the world, ever in human history, that will be as unique as you are. So that's the very first thing is that your crazily beautiful, unique pattern of synaptic connections is yours alone. And it will be extinguished when you die. And it will never shine that way again. It's like you are so bloody precious. Second, we know that you will grow more synaptic connections in the areas of your brain where you have the most pre-existing synaptic connections. So it's not as though we should have a fixed mindset. There's only one Hala and she can't uh, change or grow. She can change and grow, you, just every one of your listeners can, but you will change and grow in those areas where you've already got lots of thickets of synaptic, synaptic connections. Your brain doesn't rewire itself. So anybody that's taking a quote unquote growth mindset to their career, please remember Unfortunately, Carol Dweck in her book about this doesn't talk about any of this at all. But it, this doesn't mean that you can rewire your brain and holler, you could become me. Not in terms of all of my incredibly crazy synaptic connections in my head. Those are mine. 
And all of the natural behaviors and loves and loathes and strengths and weaknesses that they create are mine. And all the weird inconsistencies and, and irregularities and opaqueness of that, the complexity of that, is all mine. Yours are all yours. And when you grow, you become, your, your, your thick synaptic connections become thicker. And actually, your weaker ones, they, they atrophy, they wither away. So over the course of your life, you can grow and change, but you don't grow and change into someone else. Yeah. Anyway, sorry yes. to bang on so, about that. No, it's so interesting. No, I love this conversation. I feel like everyone's going to find so much value in it. Uh, very entertaining and interesting. Um, so I have a team like we talked about. I have already over 40 employees and we have a very happy company culture. And I think that it's because naturally I do this. I really compliment everybody on their strengths. And since we are a startup, everyone kind of can land grab where, where they feel most productive and happy. And so it's not like I'm like, here, you're a graphic designer and you have to do this exact job. It's kind of like you're on the graphic design team. Go do what you're going to be best at. Like that's kind of my attitude. So um, I actually think I'm going to do this love and loathe thing for my team, have them do that for two weeks, track all their activities so it's that I can just see that mm. and know, you know, to kind of put people on the projects that they're best at and just have that, you know, information to help me make decisions going forward. I think it's so useful. Is there anything else leaders can do to kind of make sure that their team is working on their strengths? Well, f first of all, just remember, and I did the same as you, when I built a company of 100 engineers, and you're, it's a whole software company, and you, it's fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I'm sure you're finding this as a leader that actually the bigger the company gets, the more you realize that every single part of your life really is a, is a, is a people equation. It might be people as yeah. it relates to customers or people as it relates to the folks that you're hiring and working with, but suddenly you have to become a, a really deep expert in humans, yeah. Um, which is why all of the stuff that we're talking about here is super relevant to anybody who's listening who's a leader because you, you have to try to figure out how to get the best out of humans or how to sell to, to humans and all the strategic thinking in the world or all the financing in the world isn't going to help you if you can't find customers and you can't exactly. find really people. Um, so in terms of like how you can help people capitalize on their strengths, the, by the way, if you do that love and loathe it thing, um, yeah. what you're trying to get them to do in the end is sort of write, I know this is going to sound weird, you're going to try to get them to write down a couple of love notes to themselves. As in, I love it when, and then you get, because remember, if they did this for two weeks, they'd have a whole bunch of activities written down in the love dick column, and a whole bunch yeah. of activities written down in the love dick column. And you sort of want to turn to them at the end of two weeks and go, okay, write three love notes to yourself. Not, I'm amazing at, no, 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 you're not bragging. You're just going, I'm at my best when, or I love it when, or I get a kick out of it when. Just write three for yourself. If you don't want to show them to me, don't show them to me. But for you, team member, take ownership for the love that you draw from your life. You know, we, we said there's five love languages. No, there aren't. There are nine billion love languages. Learn to speak yours. So, so write yourself a love note, which basically is, I'm at my best when note and use the raw material of that loved it loaded activity as your raw material. Don't pull it out of the air, pull it out of last week, pull it out of last week and write down, I'm at my best when. And then perhaps, and this is so fun to do, you get your team together, not 40 because it's too big. So you'll have to break it down into smaller teams, but mm -hmm. you can spend two hours and it's a great two hours where everyone just shares their love, <laughs> shares their love notes. I'm at my best when this. Now, you're not saying I'm the best at. That is a totally different claim. You sort of don't want that. You're, I'm, I'm the best at this. Okay, shut up, okay? Who knows <laughs> who's the best at? But if you say I'm at my best when, huh? Well, now no one can come in and say, no, you're not, because this came out of your life. So it would be a, it's a very good thing if you're running a team, if you do that love it, load that activity, the next thing to do, each person writes a love note, right? I would suggest three. And then the next thing, if you really wanted to accelerate your team's collaboration, share it, because it's weird. We don't know one another. We make these stupid generalizations about one another, not stupid, but, but we see someone's superficiality. They're a, a white man, or they're a black woman, or they're a Palestinian, you know, and we sort of make a, yeah. that's a, he's a, uh, you know, a, a New York Patriot, New York Jets uh, supporter, and he's an idiot Patriots, and, and we make these generalizations, 
And of course, they hide the beautiful uniqueness of each team member. So that's a good thing to do is to go sit, to go around and go, listen, we're not going to say what all of our skills and certifications are because who the heck knows what all those are. Or we can go on LinkedIn and see what those are. But, yeah. but when are you at your best? Boy, I mean, seriously, if we did this with, we had 100 people, so we had like about eight or nine di different teams. And we did this every three months. Wow. It's a great two hours because you're like, oh, I didn't. And of course you can, if you wanted to do it the next time you meet, you can do the inverse. I'm drained when, I really find it difficult when, I'm at my worst when. And that doesn't mean that you can slough it off. Oh, therefore I'm not going to do it. No, no, no. But it's a wonderful thing, Hala, in your company to be the kind of company where it's okay to say, I am super geeked by this and this and this and this and this. And this over here, I'm, you're going to get a B minus a B version of me. I know that sometimes I have to do it. I totally get it. I totally get it. But don't ask me to crush it. If you keep bringing me, it's like, I remember when I was working for a boss one time, I, I spent all weekend putting together 27 different options of what we could do. Because I kind of like processing everything and pulling it apart. And I put together this kind of PowerPoint presentation that would have made the NASA moon landing look simple. You know, I had all these, <laughs> if we did this, then we would do this. We did, and I brought it into her and, I, and she liked me. And about 10 minutes in, I could see she was doing that, you know, the telltale signs that she was uh, bored or, or frustrated, checking the watch, looking up. And I stopped and I'm like, look, what? I, I spent all week, I spent all weekend on this. And she's like, Marcus, I'm really busy. I expect, I, I trust you, dude. Come in with two things. Tell me why you'd pick the one. And I'm almost 99% of the time going to pick the one that you pick. And, and for her, she took information, she didn't take information in, in the way that I did. She took it in, in a way that I presume you've thought this through, come to me with two options, make, make a decision. Now that isn't, she's not right. I'm not wrong. But what you do when you do that kind of activity, when you share with one another, I take information in this way. Oh, I take it in this way. Or I'm at my best with this. I'm at my best with that. What you're doing is simply building awareness. Mm. Now, sometimes I'm going to have to do something a little outside my comfort zone because she wants me to just snap a decision off. Okay. But at least I now know that's how she's taking information in. And she knows that's how I'm taking information. And awareness is this beautifully powerful part of A, building a great career, but also building a great team. The opposite of awareness is assumption. And so everything that we're talking about here is getting past assumptions about, oh, I know graphic designers. All graphic designers are like this. Okay, no, they're not. Each graphic designer is weird and cool and different. <laughs> and you've got to put in place inside your teams, and I hope you do do this, some ways to cut through assumptions and let people use the specificity of their own daily life to share a few really cool love notes about how you could get the best out of them. Yeah, I love this. We're definitely going to do this at Yap Media. So thank you so much for that uh, activity. I can't wait to do it with my team. I know that you have like 20 years of research experience. And so you've researched a lot of different topics. You have many different books. We're on the topics of managers. So over the years, you've done lots of research studies on this. What makes the best qualities in a manager while we're on this topic? Well, that's hard to say, right? Because every manager is different. What we do know is that every really, really great manager has the ability to individualize. If you can't individualize, you can't build a great team because a great team isn't built up a bunch of the same people. The, 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 the team, if you will, people always say there's no I in team, as though the point of a team is to remind you that you're not that special. It's like, no, no, that's a complete misunderstanding of what teams are for. You bring teams together because a team is the place in which lots of different people, lots of unique eyes, actually make a contribution together and they achieve something together they couldn't do by themselves. The point of a team are the eyes. So, so individualization, if you want to be a really good team leader, cultivate, and some part of this is a skill. It's not just a natural strength. Some part of managing is learning how to see the clues. Can you see where somebody has rapid learning? Can you see where one of your team members just gets in the zone? and, and they, they just seem to be in flow. Can you see where people are naturally volunteering? And, and not, in a, not in a miss instinct kind of way. I mean, some people's instincts are, they, they're instinctively raising their hand for a job because the job 
comes with certain benefits, uh, money, uh, prize, prestige, American Idol, all those people like volunteering. They're volu are they really volunteering for learning a hundred words or songs to a hundred words to a hundred songs, practicing all those times by yourself? Are they really volunteering for the actual activities of what it takes to be an American Idol? Or are they volunteering because they want the praise and the money or the attention? We've got a lot of misinstincts in our lives because no one's ever really taught us to inventory what our own natural uh, strengths are. So as a, as a manager, individualization is a really important thing. But the second, the second thing I would say, and this is less hala, an attribute and more just a behavior. Mm -hmm. and by the way, in Yap Media, you, this, you should do this too because this is free and, and it's just everything. Um, the best team leaders check in with each person on their team for 15 minutes each week individually. And the conversation in that 15 minutes, and you could call it a check-in or a touch base or a conversation or a one-on-one, -on -one, the word doesn't matter. But, but that 15 minutes isn't about feedback on this week. Hey, let me tell you how you did. Let me tell you. No, it's, it's a short-term future-focused conversation about next week in which the manager is just asking two questions. Um, what are your priorities this week and how can I help you? What are your priorities? How can I help you? And the best managers realize you don't do that as a group. I mean, you can get your team together as a group if you want, but every week, each individual on that team is basically invisibly raising their hand and going, can you pay attention to me? Can you pay attention to me? Can you pay attention to me? Every human being's got like an attention bucket, but the bucket has a hole in it. And so you fill my bucket in the course of a week by going, Okay, what are your priorities next week? What are you working on? How, how can I help? And then you think, well, I've done that, so I don't have to do that now for another five months with that person. <laughs> no, <laughs> oh, next Friday, you kind of got to do it again. And then you kind of got to do it again. And you got to do it again. And if any of your listeners are thinking, well, I can't do that because I've got too many people, then you've got too many people. It's like, what's the perfect span of control in a young business like yours? It's not span of control. It's span of attention. And, and the perfect span of attention is how many people can you as a team leader legitimately check in with every week for 52 weeks. And also, yeah. if you are a team leader or you're aspiring to be one in your career and you're listening to this and you're thinking to yourself, well, that sounds boring. I don't want to check in with each of my people every week. It's, I, I, I want to be strate strategizing. I want to be, you know, I want to be doing the cool, sexy leadership -y stuff. Uh, then don't lead people. Because if you don't want to check in with each person and find out, What's going on in their head and how can I help? Every single week, because things change so quickly. If, if that doesn't interest you, don't lead people. Because this thing, this check-in thing, isn't like in addition to leading. It is leading. And if that doesn't interest you, then go be smart by yourself. Or maybe you and one other person. But if you want to try to get the most out of a team of people, you've got to check in with them each week about near-term future with your strengths lens on, so you're looking for where they've shown some sort of signs of real achievement, rapid learning in the zone, and you're trying always, in the face of a changing world, right, the goals that you put together for your company back in June were irrelevant by July. That's, that's how quickly the world, and it's not just COVID, that's just every year is like that. Yeah. We, we have a whole other conversation about goals, by the way, but if you're a team leader, yes, you need to individualize, but then this, this, this frequent light touch check-in. No one will tell you this, by the way. I don't know why, but no one will tell you this. And yet, I promise you, if you're leading a team right now and you get in this habit, it's like brushing your teeth. You don't need to have a perfect coaching moment every check-in. Some check-ins, you'll just go, oh, and okay, and I'll do my best. And that's all you've got that week for that person. But that's okay, because <laughs> next week, you're going to ask them again, and again, and again, and again. It's like your year is 52 little sprints as you pay attention to each person. Last quick point on the data, the data show that the modality doesn't matter. Whether you're doing it in person, whether you're doing it on the phone, in app, on a text, uh, on an email, it actually doesn't matter. What matters is that it happens, not the way in which it happens. So weirdly, crazily, the most powerful team ritual you can put in place as a manager is not a team ritual. It's a one-on-one -on -one check in with each person, super light touch. If they go beyond 20 minutes, well, maybe you decide that three of them in the year will go beyond 20 minutes because you just want a fuller debrief. But most of them are just 10 to 20 minutes of like, what are you working on? How can I help? 
Yeah. And so do you recommend, like, I have a C, I'm a CEO of a company and I have sub teams. So do you recommend that each leader does this with their sub team? Or do you yeah. recommend that I do that for every single person? No, no, absolutely not. Your role as a CEO is totally different, which we can get to in a minute if you want to. But, but no, um, your role right now as a CEO, you're building teams of teams. You're building teams of teams. In fact, your most important job right now as a CEO is how do I ensure that I'm putting in place the right ways to build lots of teams like my best teams? Yes. It's like we found out, obviously, you ask people this question around the world, 84% of people say they do most of their work on teams. 84%. There's a few people in the shed at the bottom of the garden all by themselves permanently doing just work. There are a few people like that. Most of us, though, even the smartest of us, we're doing work on teams. 65% of us say we do most of our work on more than one team and that that team isn't reflected on the org chart. It's a dynamic, ephemeral team that came together for six weeks over here or it came together for four months over here. So most of us have a formal team and then a couple of other kind of uh, coming together teams. But yeah. teams are work. And I don't mean teamwork, you know, that kind of cliche. <laughs> oh, you've got to be more teamy. No, no, no. Work is teamwork. So what you should be doing as a CEO is you should be going, am I building more teams like my best teams? Which begins, of course, with anybody that I'm, the most important decision you make, by the way, in your growing company is who you make team leader. Yeah. So goes your team leaders. So goes everything. You could be the smartest person in the world. And if you're putting in place people that don't get a kick out of individualization, that really actually want to tell people what to do because they're into control. They don't want to check in with everybody each week individually because it bores them to tears and they're way more interested in themselves. If you keep doing that, I don't care how smart you are, Hala, your company's going nowhere because no mm -hmm. one will want to work there or if they do come work for you, they won't stay. You, you, you join a company, people may join your company because of you, because you're cool, because you're out there, because you're exciting, because of your innovative, but how long they stay and how productive they are while they're with you doesn't depend on you. It depends massively on that little local team. So yeah, the short answer to the question is, each one of your team leaders should be doing this. And if they don't yeah. want to do it, that is a red flag for you. Yeah, I think this is such a great point. You made me think about something that I've said before on this podcast, that you can be a great employee and you could be great at what you do. And it doesn't mean that you have to eventually lead people. There's lots of people who aren't great at leading and they can lead in their own way as an individual contributor and not have a team. And that's how they, how they perform well. Just because somebody performs well doesn't mean you just promote them to be, lead a team because it's very different skills. And so I think that's a brilliant point that you make and it just like really drives that point home. And, and, and to put specificity to it, it really sort of means if you, r rather than, you're, you're not going to be a great leader, rather than saying it that way, you can almost say to people, look, let me tell you what leading is. Leading is figuring out the uniqueness of each person and then paying attention to that person in the work, that person in the work, that person in the work for 52 weeks of the year. Are you interested in that? Because if you're not, yeah. then in terms of the going all the way back to the definition of a strength and a weakness, if that doesn't strengthen you, and by the way, we could try it out. We could try it out. Why don't we try it out? And the thing we're trying out isn't some elusive concept called leadership. We're actually just trying out an activity. We're going to maybe, maybe we'll put you in a, a dynamic or ephemeral team. We'll give you a little project. We'll give you a project for about six months. I don't know, six weeks, whatever it is. You can try it out and see whether or not checking in with each person about near term future work when you can't tell them what to do. You have to manage by remote control, not more control. You have less control. Let's mm. see whether or not you get any sort of kick out of that. Because if you don't, that's the job of leading. And if that right now, for whatever reason, doesn't thrill you or doesn't give you any jolt or anything, then the money, if it comes with more money or the bigger title, if it comes with a bigger title, that's not going to carry the day. It's like in the end, if you want to build a really great career, the what always trumps the why or the who with. Even if you super believe in the why, by the way, I'm a huge fan of Simon Sinek stuff, so find your why, okay, that's cool. And, and obviously the people you work with, the who, that's important. But if what you're doing every day at 10.30 in the morning on a Tuesday, or what you're doing at 3 p.m. on a Friday, if the activities themselves don't uh, strengthen you, then that will always in the end 
burn you up. Burnout comes not from losing your why. It from, comes from doing the wrong what in service of the why. Mm. So in that sense, if you want to know if you want to be a, a team leader in your life, having an activity that we can go, oh, leading's that. All right, well, let's try that. And let's see whether yeah. or not you get any kind of thrill out of that. And if you don't, as you said, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you couldn't be incredibly successful in your career. It means you're yeah. probably going to be successful mostly because of your own efforts, your own insights, and less about your ability to build, to build teams or teams of teams. Yeah. Everyone shouldn't aspire to be you. I mean, if I looked at your job, your life, you know, there's going to be a whole lot of activities that a lot of us would go, oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have a life. So all of us have got different thrills that we get from life. And of course, that doesn't mean we're wrong or right. It just means, it just means we're us. Yeah, that's excellent. I want to do a quick ch time check. Oh, yeah. Do you have 10 more minutes? I do, it's yeah. 12, 10. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I do, and I'm just going to ask you about your another piece of research. Sure. So I also know, in addition to all of this, you know, management research, you've recently done some research on COVID, or you've had data since COVID happened, and you did this on engagement and resilience, and you did a lot of studies around that. So can you explain what that study was, why you did it, and some key takeaways that you found? Yeah, we did a, a thousand people. So I run this research institute called the ADP Research Institute. Um, and it's focused, I'm not really focused on the employment, unemployment levels. Um, I have a really good colleague who does all of that. I'm focused on all the stuff that relates to people and performance at work. So the things that we're talking about here. And the fact that we have this institute affords me a chance. If I have a question, I can go out and ask the world, which is great. So we did yeah. 25 countries, uh, a stratified random sample, which means you stratify your sample to reflect the working population of each country. And we did it for 25 countries around the world. And we actually oversampled. So it's about 26,000 people total. And we were asking questions about resilience and engagement. And those are two slightly different things which we could get into maybe at some other time. Um, but particularly as it relates to COVID. And the theory going in that I had was that the countries that have responded best to COVID would be the most resilient countries. So like New Zealand, that had had fewer deaths, fewer cases, fewer drops in employment would be more resilient. And like um, Brazil, with higher cases, higher rates, higher deaths, and, and higher rises in unemployment, that would be less resilient. So 25 countries, you split it into high impact from COVID, medium, low, and annoyingly, we have this kind of beautiful, reliable way of measuring resilience, which again, we can talk about, um, but it, there was no difference. It turns out there was no difference. So from a researcher standpoint, it was super annoying because you go <laughs> into the theory and, <laughs> and the theory doesn't hold true. But we did find this, which is fascinating. Well, I thought it was fascinating. We asked people, did you have COVID? Did your family have COVID? Friends have COVID? Team have COVID? At the time, 34% of people in the world said yes to one of those. Um, if you said yes to one of those, if you had it, friends had it, family had it, if you're one of the 34%, you're three times more likely to be highly resilient. We then asked people a list of changes in the workplace. Did you have PPE in the workplace? Changed hours, more virtual? Um, changes in vacation time, did you have more technology, all sorts of changes. If you said that you had five or more of these changes, you were 13 times more likely to be highly resilient. So what that means is each one of us will be more resilient the more intimate our experience of this disease has been and the more changes we encountered at work, the more resilient we are. Humans, it turns out, don't fear change. We don't fear changes at work. We don't even fear changes associated with this pandemic. What we fear is the unknown. If that disease is, if we've never encountered it, nobody we know has encountered it. Now it's just some scary boogeyman. Some, we don't know what it is even. Mm. That's really scary. When, when company leaders tell us, we're gonna get back to normal. We're gonna read Hastings saying at Netflix, we're gonna get back into Netflix. 12 hours after the first vaccine, everyone's back at Netflix so that we can bump into one another and collaborate and be amazing. Like when, when, when leaders say that, by the way, no knock on Reed Hastings, Netflix is a great company, he's super <laughs> fun. But that's the wrong thing to say. We don't want to rush back to normal. If normal, normal has more ambiguity and uncertainty in it, we don't want to go there. We like change. We like specificity. We like vividness. We can deal with that, even if the vividness is a scary disease. 
t- tell us what it looks like, show us what it looks like. We're good that way. We're not good when something remains in the dark, unknown. Mm. So all these leaders, particularly company leaders that were sort of trying to mollify us or sugarcoat things, everything's fine, everything's gonna be fine. Or our corporate leaders, we'll get back to work, it'll be great. If they were doing that to try to up our levels of resilience, they got it completely wrong. We like it, humans like it. When, when we can see the challenge ahead of us, we know you're there with us, but we can see the challenge ahead of us and we can figure out for ourselves how we, how we accommodate that challenge, take it in, figure out a way around it or through it or over it and move on. There was a famous Austrian psychologist in the 30s, not, not Mark Freud and, and not Adler, or not Jung, but his name was Viktor Frankl and he wrote an amazing book called Man's Search for Meaning which he wrote while he was in a concentration camp for five years. And he came out and he said, there's three sources of meaning. But the third one was your response to unavoidable suffering. We get meaning from our response to unavoidable suffering. Not avoidable, like you don't go seek it out. But if something hits you, one of the ways in which we find meaning in life is the way in which we respond to that. So this COVID research basically showed, and this was true around the world, Carla. There wasn't like, oh, Brazil is like this, Iceland is like that. No, these patterns were true across the world. When you show us the unavoidable challenges, we get stronger when we can see them and move through them. Which now that I'm saying it that way, I realize it sort of sounds obvious, I suppose, but it was kind of unbelievable to me that we could see so clearly, you know, if you have five or more, the more changes you have at work, the more resilient you are. It was like, wow. That's a lesson for leaders, isn't it? Don't try and yeah. code. Be specific, be vivid. We'll be fine. We'll be more than fine. We'll be resilient. We'll bounce up, not just back. Yeah, that is incredible, incredible information. And it's, it's so, you said that it sounds obvious, but I don't think it sounds obvious at all because I would have figured that if you were impacted, you would be less resilient. But then I think of my own story. I mean, I got, my whole family got COVID back in April. My dad passed away from it. And I, like my whole career and everything skyrocketed for me after that. So I guess personally, it, it definitely resonates and it's true for me. Um, so that's very interesting. In terms of uh, the I'm future. Sorry for your loss. I, uh, my, oh, my that's okay. Too, and my, we've all, I am not suggesting, of course, that it's good to have. It's like simply when suffering is unavoidable, when it comes upon us, we realize that we can manage things in ways that almost enable us, give us self-efficacy. And yeah, your dad's situation and your own relationship to it is a really interesting and, and, and in so many ways, terrible and horrible. In other ways, it, it manifests you and is, is a thing that you'll draw strength from as you move through life. Yeah, because it's like, so many bad things happened and unless you know want to just dwell in the negativity or you know i'm not that type of person where i would just kind of shut down it made me motivate me because i realized life is short you sure. know and we only have this amount of time and you know you want to make people proud who who supported you and loved you and just yeah. it actually motivated me to just keep working harder honestly and i turned everything up so uh, mm-hmm. definitely resonates with me um how about uh, the future of work Knowing all this information, knowing that, I mean, we don't exactly know when COVID is going to be over, but once COVID is over, what do you think the future of work will be like? Oh, gosh. Well, there's so many different ways to, to angle around that. We could talk about technology. We could talk about, um, you know, work from anywhere. Uh, undoubtedly, yeah. there will be a need for all of us to figure out how to impose our own rituals in our own life. We do know that human beings are more resilient. We are more engaged when we have oscillation in our lives, stress, recover, stress, recover, stress, recover, stress, recover. And in the past, when we all just got up and went to the office and went to work and then came home, that that oscillation was forced on us. And now, of course, with many of us, and this will be true, I think, for a long time, we'll be working remotely. We, we will have to uh, create those oscillation rituals ourselves. You know, in your life right now, you've got to put, impose on yourself a stress recovery ritual so that you don't just stress all the time or recover all the time. Um, yeah. so that um, We do know, by the way, though, that when we did this global research on engagement, the most engaged people, and we did this before COVID as well. So the year before COVID, we did this. 
The most engaged people were people that worked from home four days a week and worked in the office one day a week uh, because wow. it gave people more chance to set their own schedule and more chance to do what they loved. So this whole thing about COVID has made us um, remote and remote is horrible and dangerous and difficult and lonely. Some parts of that have aspects of truth, but, but actually the most engaged workers in the world were people that worked at home four days a week and then you came in for one day a week. That isn't to say that everybody should do that and isn't even to say that everyone can do that. But moving forward, the future of work is going to look a lot like that and it's not bad because you ask people whether they feel like they're part of a team and whether they worked in an office or didn't, didn't correlate with whether they felt they were part of a team. Some team leaders are clearly able to build a sense of team as a state of mind, not a state of place. And so the fact that the future of work is going to have more remote in it um, doesn't mean that we can't all flourish and it doesn't mean that we can't all be uh, part of a team. We can. And of course, with your company, it'll mean that you'll need to keep telling your team leaders, how do you make people feel part of a small team? Um, that's an ongoing challenge. We can come back another time maybe and talk about how, how to do that. One of the things obviously is that ritual of a check-in. Like you can do that yeah. remotely. Um, the only other thing I would say, I think, is that, that this has reminded us of more and more, and your own example here is a, is a, is a jolly good one. We haven't taken love seriously. The Mayo Clinic did a bunch of research. This is pre-pandemic. Did a bunch of research on burnout in doctors and nurses. And one of the things they found, mostly because doctors and nurses seem to be burning out at unprecedented yeah. levels before the pandemic, you had levels of PTSD higher in emergency room nurses, twice as high in emergency room nurses as you did in veterans returning from war zones. So it was like the Mayo Clinic was like something is going wrong. <laughs> so they did a bunch of investigating and they found that, that if you'd have 20% of activities in your job that you love, just 20%. Not, in a sense, not do what you love, because that would be 100%, but find love in what you do, 20%. If you can even have 20% of your, do your job as a doctor or as a nurse, be some activities that you love, then you are much less likely to burn out. And in fact, they found this beautiful linear relationship between going down on amount of love and up in burnout risk. So 19, 18, 17, 16% of your job that you loved there was a commensurate one percentage point increase in burnout risk. So what that, oh, and by the way, if you had 50% of what you love or 100%, you didn't get much increase in resilience at all. It was almost like 20% was like a threshold. You got above 20% and that was cool for you. You could thrive. So what that tells me anyway is that you don't, to, to make people in the future of work thrive, we don't need to build yoga studios next to operating rooms or meditation rooms next to ERs as a way to escape work. Mm. Work itself, if you can find what you love in the work itself, which bits of it for you are one of those 20%? I called them um, red threads. The fabric of your work life has many, many threads, many people, situations, contexts. Some, some of them are black, white, gray, brown, emotionally a little up or emotionally a little down, but sort of neutral. Mm -hmm. But some are red threads. Some activities really are what we called earlier your strengths. Some activities you love. You lean into them. You learn fast. You're like, you're, you're, you're magnificent. You're super attractive when you're doing them because people can sort of get it. You, mm -hmm. you don't need a red quilt. You need 20% mm. of your quilt is, is red. What are your red threads? If we can have a serious conversation about love and take people's loves, their red threads seriously, then we can start to weave love into contribution, which of course you running a company of 40 people, you're really going from love to contribution. How do you help someone go use those threads to weave something bloody cool that our customers want? That should be like an infinite loop. And I don't think, you know, you look around the world, 17% of us are highly resilient, 16% of us are fully engaged. That is terrible. Pre-pandemic, it was only ever so slightly higher. So for most companies, and I hope this isn't true for yours, Hala, but work is not a place in which you get to manifest the best of yourself. Work is a place, and those 360 surveys you mentioned before, feedback, all this sort of stuff, actually smothers you. And... The future of work is going to be a place where at some point we go, we're jacked up on Adderall, we're medicating ourselves with Xanax, and, this, and these are the kids doing that, not the 50-year-olds. 
it's like we've got an epidemic here where work makes us strangers to ourselves with the pursuit of money. It's like, no, no, love and work are super linked. And I don't mean do what you love, but can we intelligently find love in what we do so that we don't languish down at 15 or 16% of us fully engaged at work when we're at work 50, 60 hours a week? Yeah. It's like, we've, I think the future of work is gonna ask a lot of questions about whether we've built loveless workplaces and can we do better? Can we take people's love seriously, not to pat them on the head, or even to compliment them, but can we take their love seriously? Because loveless excellence, loveless excellence is an oxymoron. Loveless service, loveless creativity, loveless innovation, they're all oxymoronic. If you want excellence, innovation, creativity, you've got to have love in it. So I think work, the future works, and I know this is going to sound weird, but love in work is a really important and interesting conversation for a CEO like you to engage yeah. with. If you want excellence, if you want to just burn people up and spit them out, well, then that's a whole other ball game, and some businesses do that. Mm -hmm. but, but that's not good for the future of us, and it's not really good for the future of work. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love this conversation. I feel like my listeners are gonna really love it too. Like I, I feel like I learned so much and it was just so eye-opening, so actionable. Like I feel like I know exactly what to do to kind of build my team in the right way. And I feel like a lot of people are gonna find value in this, whether they're leaders or employees okay. um, or students, you know? So I think I think this was an excellent conversation. Well, so the last you. question, yeah, it was it was really good, Marcus. The last question I ask all my guests is, what is your secret to profiting in life? What is my secret to profiting in life? Yes, and it doesn't have to be financially related. It can be professional, uh, you know, social. You know, there's a, the Western philosophy says, I think, therefore, I am, right? Cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. But there is an African philosophy called Ubuntu, which basically says, no, we only exist in relation to other people. You're not out there by yourself thinking. Everything isn't cognitive. It's not I think, therefore I am. It's I am because you are. We all exist in beautiful relationship to one another. So my secret to profiting in life for me, but for you too, and for your listeners would be look to your left and look to your right. Because you are because of who they are. Who are you moving through life with? That includes your life partner, the person you choose to do life with, includes your colleagues. Um, your beautiful uniqueness is manifested not by itself. It is manifested through the attention, the challenge, the curiosity of someone else helping you to demystify yourself so that you can contribute. So, so look to your left, look to your right, and remember that the goal of any great relationship that you have in life is to make each one of you bigger. And you should only surround yourself with people whose goal is to help you be bigger, the biggest version of you, not threatened by you, not blind to you, uh, not controlling of you, not trying to be you. Uh, the goal of any relationship is that that other person sees you and wants you to be bigger. And I think the thing that I've learned in my life anyway, and I've done, my career is a little bit like yours over the years, um, writing books, speaking, being individually productive, starting a company, having a company grow like crazy, having another bigger company coming and buy my, like now I'm you know here doing this with you. It's, it's been an interesting scavenger hunt for love. But the biggest lesson I'm going to take from my life is that I am, because you are. And so who's the you in that sentence? Who am I surrounding myself with? Um, for every one of your listeners, um, they aren't an island. They're not by themselves. Uh, they're super connected. And so think very carefully about who you're choosing to walk through life with. And if they're wanting you to be bigger, hold on tight. Because that's the way in which you live the full wow. life. That is so powerful. I, I would love to talk to you more about this, but I know we're running up on time, but that is amazing. Great advice. Where can our listeners go to learn more about you and everything that you do? Uh, well, probably Instagram. My Instagram is good. 
Um, what is it? M W. Maybe we'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> there you go, Marcus Buckingham. I should know what that is. And then my website is marcusbuckingham.com, um, which is my name. The other place to go though is because I run this institute. If any of your listeners are into the data stuff, um, if they want the data, the real reports themselves, and, and then they like that, and some of them might. Um, go to ADPRI, ADPRI Research Institute, so ADPRI.org, and you can mm-hmm. find like a five-minute version of these studies, a 20-minute version, PowerPoints, sort of whatever your appetite is. So Mark, MarcusBuckingham.com or ADPRI.org are the places that I go. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marcus. This was an amazing conversation. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Young and Profiting Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please write us a review or comment on your favorite platform. Nothing makes us happier than reading your reviews. We'd love to hear what you think about the show. And don't forget to share this podcast with your friends, family, and on social media. I always repost, reshare, and support those who support us. You can find me on Instagram at Yap with Hala or LinkedIn. Just search for my name. It's Hala Taha. Big thanks to the Yap team as always. This is Hala signing off.